Netherlands from Delft in the Netherlands, where I'm visiting the annual Eurographics conference. If you ever get a chance to see Delft, it's a really very, very beautiful little town and yeah, definitely, definitely well worth a visit. It's also home to some, well, not home, but f home to, formerly home to some very special people. One is famous Fritz Post, a former professor of visualization at TU Delft. And the other one is Charles Bota, who used to work, used to be a professor here, but then moved back to South Africa. Anyway, I have some very happy memories from this place, and I still have a bet with Charles that I'm going to win in the year 2019. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, to the student questions. One, the first question today is, hi Bob, I'm, I, I, in the mark scheme it says to provide details about a programming reference book and I'm not really sure why I'd need to do that. Could you please clarify what this means? I haven't used any programming books to do the assignment. Yes, I can try to clarify that. So I get a lot of correspondence from students saying things like, Dear Bob, I can't program. Or, Dear Bob, I don't know how to program this thing. Or, Dear Bob, my programming skills are really, really weak and now I'm, I'm going to die. <laughs> and I can't do this thing. And my response is almost always the same. My response is, well, what programming reference book are you using to help yourself? And the answer to that question is always the same too. I'm not using any programming reference book. So I would never expect anybody to do any programming without using a reference book. And I still use reference books whenever I do programming. Always, always. I can't remember exactly how to do things. I can't re always remember syntaxes. So I always use a programming reference book and I always recommend one to students who are learning programming. Always. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh Bob, I just use Google. I, you know, I don't need any books. <clears throat> now Google is very, very useful. Definitely it's very useful. I use it every day, so I'm not going to say that Google is not useful. And web pages are also useful. But for learning programming, it is still very, very important and a very good idea to have a programming reference book. And that's for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that books are more pedagogical than web pages. So web pages are generally trying to supply, I would say, quick and dirty, quick, very quick and shallow answers to questions. Uh, another, another thing is books go into a lot more depth than typical web pages on any programming subject or any programming topic. So in assignment two, the programming exercise is essentially a file I.O. exercise. So it makes a lot of sense. If I was a student in this module doing this, I would take out my programming reference book and read the chapter on file I.O. Every single programming book in the world has a chapter on file input and output and I would read the chapter and by the way I still do that I've already read chapters on file IO but if I have to do any programming on file IO I still get out my reference books and look up the file IO advice that they have the 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 depth of the knowledge that you get is much greater than that of a web page typically so you get the, a, a textbook will explain why things are happening and how things are working in a, in a much more 
let's say, a higher quality way than, than a web page will. And there are some reasons for that too. But basically, it, it, partially it's because of due to accountability. A textbook is written by a person, a person with an identity, right? And that person has spent years of their life trying to write down quality content, uh, quality pedagogical content, typically in, in the case of a programming textbook. And so they, 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 their name is attached to that, to that content and therefore their reputation is also attached to that content. So they're going to invest more effort into raising the quality and also getting it correct. A person that writes on a web page, for a web page there's no accountability. There's all, usually no author attached to it or the author's name is anonymous like, I don't know, Jojo1 2,511 or something like that. So there's no accountability for the content you see on web pages typically. That means anybody could be writing it anonymously and if it's right or wrong it's not usually there are no consequences for being right or wrong on a, on a web page. And, and if somebody does write something on a web page that's wrong it can be deleted very quickly where you can't do that in a book Right? You want to write something that's correct to the best of your knowledge when you're writing a book. So therefore, the quality of the information you're reading in a book is higher than that of, of a web page. Right? There are lots of web pages where people are just writing very low quality content in an anonymized way because they don't want to be held accountable or they don't want to be responsible for their own writing or whatever it is they're saying. So yes, Google is great for quick and dirty answers, but if you want to understand a subject with more accuracy and more depth, books, especially textbooks, are the way to go. Now I know what you're thinking again because I have psychic powers and that is well, I don't have the money to spend on books. That is a matter of perspective in, in a lot of ways. I'm not going to have a long discussion about that. One of the most famous educational quotes, that one of my favorite educational quotes is, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And that's from the president, former president of Harvard University from a long time ago. I can't remember the name. But that, you know, if you don't, if you believe you don't have the money to spend on books, that's not an excuse either because there's a website called freetechbooks.com, which I mention quite often and I did mention in lecture, where you can download free, thousands of free programming reference books you know, without paying anything. So that uh, that's not a very good reason to, to not look and, and read books. So now about the assignment. So the assignment is just asking you for a programming reference book. If you didn't use a programming reference book, but you still did well, you still did the assignment, then okay. But if you want to get the, all the points for the coursework, you still have to put down a programming reference book just to show me that you know how to find a programming reference book and you could find one if you needed one. And be sure to put the title of the book, the author of the book, the year the book was published, and the publisher, the name of the publisher. You'll need all four of those pieces of information for the full points. I hope that answers that question. And then the other question is... Hello Bob, I'm working on the final set of data for the coursework, the human visualization, and I have got what to me was the instantly, obviously visualization of the data, which was to put all the slices together and to be able to scroll through them. This was quite easy to achieve, Voreen, and I wonder if this is enough. 
And if it is, then should I do something significantly different for the second visualization as, a, as I am unable to think of anything else? So we discussed a number of volume visualization techniques in the module. Slicing was one of them. ISO surfacing was another one. Direct volume rendering was another one. So you can use any three of those techniques. Right? The idea is to use two volume visualization techniques for each data set as a pedagogical exercise. That's, that's the idea. With direct volume rendering, you can, you can generate all sorts of different kinds of images right, using those different transfer functions. So I recommend you try out another volume visualization technique other than, in addition to slicing. It's very similar to assignment one where you have that one data set in part one and you have five different designs, visual designs. Well here you have four data sets and each of those use two different visual designs. And it's all about pedagogy essentially and to get you to try different volume visualization techniques. Okay, so I hope that answers the questions. Those are questions, they're in the 40s now. I'm getting in the 40s, let me just check. Those are questions 44 and 45 on assignment two. I'm very curious to see how many questions there actually can be for assignment two. Maybe we can get up to 100 or something. But um, yeah, okay, so happy Thursday and